Welcome to our series on emerging issues in neurogenetics. Today, we're going to be talking about big data. I'm your host, Elizabeth Ross, director of the Center for Neurogenetics in the File Family Brain and Mind Research Institute at uh, Weill Cornell Medicine. I'm honored today to welcome Dr. Daniel Geschwind, who is the Senior Associate Dean and Associate Vice Chancellor for Precision Medicine at UCLA. Welcome, Dan. Thank you very much, Betsy. It's really a great honor and pleasure for me to be here as well and to talk with you. When you think of big data in genetics, what are we talking about? And how is this going to impact training, patient care, and healthcare delivery? Yeah, it's really a great question. And I think just like most revolutions in medicine, it's hard to picture the before and the after. But imagine if I could bring everything that's ever been kind of known that's in the literature and everything together, everything that's happened in our system to that, if I could analyze all the data of all the patients like that, and then bring that to bear on my patient. Plus, when I'm seeing them for the first time, I have all their genetics, at least, you know, a, a complete genome sequence, as complete as possible, as well as, you know, potentially other uh, molecular phenotyping measures, metabolomics and other things. All of that gets integrated in decision support to help me uh, care for that patient. Genetics is one piece of this big data, genetics and omics. You know, our cost of the first genome was, I don't know, $3 billion. And now we're literally moving to a planning phase in our system where we're thinking about what do we do when we have a $100 genome, which is right around the corner in the next three years. And so we have that going on, this revolution in the cost of getting genomic information on every patient, which can help with uh, prediction and prevention. But we also have this huge revolution in computer science, where now we carry around iPhones that are like as powerful as an entire room of IBM computers were, you know, 50 years ago. So, so it's kind of amazing. And so it's, it's the intersection of those two things that's really going to drive healthcare. And so, you know, it, health systems are huge systems. And um, so it's going to take some time to bring those advances into the system, but we need to be preparing for that now. In other words, if I want to be able to analyze genomes and use them in decision support, my medical system needs to be thinking about that today, even if it's not going to happen for three to five years. So, but on the research side, where discovery is happening, discovery that will then down the road impact patient care, this is already an enormous operation. Our work is focused primarily on autism, but we've used these methods across disorders now to understand what's shared and what's distinct about these psychiatric disorders. And several years ago now, in 2018, we published the first series of papers from PsychEncode. And PsychEncode is basically looking at the brain in a totally new way. We have thousands of brain, you know, of, of, of samples from patients. We have sequence, we have RNA sequence, we have the chromatin structure and epigenome, expression and splicing of genes, and we kind of integrate all of that. And it gives us an incredibly powerful way to look at how genetic variation influences brain phenotypes in health and disease. What do you think has been the principal roadblock to finding new therapeutics uh, in neurological disease broadly? How can we take advantage of our capabilities in, in big data insights now? Yeah, well, that's a very challenging question. If I had 100% perfect answer to that, I'd be way ahead of the field. But what I can say, I'll say several things. One is, if we contrast what our understanding of the brain in terms of how it functions and what it actually does with other organs like the liver or the heart or the lungs or the kidney, we really don't know how the brain works. So that's one of the really big challenges. And so therefore, it's maybe not surprising, especially in retrospect, 
that even when we understand the genetic cause of a disorder, which people originally thought would be a panacea, it takes a long time to move to therapeutics because we actually can't put that in any mechanistic context that really, you know, that is, that is you know, that we can actually validate. Um, so again, you find a gene that causes an arrhythmia in the heart, you can actually put that in the context of knowing that there's a conduction system, that there's structural proteins, and et cetera, et cetera, and kind of, you know, figure it out. In the brain, it's much tougher. And so that's one enormous challenge. Another challenge is genes don't act alone. They act in, you know, as part of complex systems. And that challenge about understanding the system of the brain and how it's working partially is because there's so many different functional hierarchies. If we have a gene that causes a disease or contributes or modifies, now we understand, you know, we have a causal anchor at least to begin to understand how things might happen. But we have to understand through chromatin, RNA, through protein, in other words, through multiple molecular hierarchies that that genetic information is propagated then to cells, and synapses, circuits that eventually lead to behavior, motor function, et cetera. And that's extraordinarily challenging. And without an underlying model about how things are working at these higher order levels. Okay. Now, a lot of our work has focused on the mRNA, not because it's the be all and end all, it's the only functional thing to study. But if you're going to study something, you want to study something that you can look at in high throughput, at high dynamic range, cost effectively. And mRNA really gives us that. I can study an mRNA that's expressed at one copy per cell or a thousand copies per cell. We can't really do that for proteins yet, but we're moving in that direction. That's very exciting. So we can study things that are very rare, very abundant. We can measure them with current methods. We can measure them in single cells even. So that's incredibly exciting. And one of the key issues here is rather than looking at one gene, we also don't look at one data type. The notion is to again move through those hierarchies, one really needs to be able to measure these different areas. So here, just showing that rather than a unidimensional approach, we like to measure the patient phenotype, their brain imaging, if we can cellular function, protein function, RNA, epigenetics, gene sequence, and connect through all of these different levels, but again, not one gene at a time, but understanding the patterns of gene expression and gene regulation that are driving brain function in health and disease. So this is really critical. So rather than looking under the street lamp, what we're doing is letting the data tell us where to look. And that's a really new paradigm that I think not enough laboratories and not enough researchers have really glommed onto in terms of trying to move from a purely hypothesis-driven approach to a data-driven approach. This is going to have a huge impact on uh, approaches to therapeutics. In neuroscience, we tend to think of disorders one gene at a, at a time, as you say, looking under the lamplight rather than uh, you know, all of the territory around. But even in studies where uh, we've used microarrays or RNA-seq or whole genome sequencing, we tend to pick the gene that is uh, thought to be driving uh, the process. How do you foresee our being able to integrate all of this data to come up with new therapeutics that perhaps will tip a pathway uh, that is leading to, uh, to a disorder? Yeah, it's a really great question. I mean, I can share our vision with you on this. And so one thing that's key is that, again, genes don't act alone. So let's dive into that in a little more detail. So what I'm showing here is a classic experiment using a microarray, which at the time, you know, measured 10,000 genes in a tissue or more. Now we, same thing with RNA sequencing, you can measure every gene in the tissue, 
essentially that's expressed. So there are two genes there. And you can see from the case in control, there's no difference between them. Statistically, there's no differential expression. But if we look at this slightly differently and ask, how are these genes related to each other? We can see in the control that they co-vary together quite remarkably. But in the case, that covariation pattern is lost. And so we can measure that much more broadly rather than now just looking at two genes, we can look at all the genes at once. So what I'm showing below that, those two genes is now, let's say we do an RNA sequencing experiment and measure every, every gene expression in a particular tissue and Alzheimer's or control doesn't really matter across many, many different individuals. We can see that there are three groups there, and this is just a cartoon, that these genes are co-varying together in patterns that make them relatively easy to group. We can cluster them to find these modules or clusters of genes. And within the network module, we can actually identify the central hub genes, just like an airline hub, that are kind of central to the function of the module. And once we identify these these clusters or these modules of genes, we can then understand what their function is because genes that play together essentially are doing the same function. So we can use these networks to measure what's going on in the brain and identify patterns of dysregulated gene networks in autism, in, in other psychiatric diseases, in neurodegenerative diseases, in stroke, you know, it goes on and on and on in neural repair to try to understand how to repair the damaged nervous system. And we've shown that if you can identify these key modules and you can find things that drive them, even without understanding the mechanism yet. So let's just give one example. I have a module that's dysregulated in Alzheimer's disease in a certain direction one that's up, one that's down, and I can identify the drivers. I can use those modules, actually, to search now in drug gene databases. So I have a whole group of 100 genes or 200 genes, some up, some down. I can search in a database and pull out a drug, the, the drugs that best match that pattern. Can I interject a, a question in there? Because it seems to me that uh, you were heading to um, a fascinating question of how we could use big data to speed up the concept drug of drug repurposing. Um, is that something that would be relevant to, to where you're heading with these modules? Yes, it's very relevant, Betsy. It's really a great question because we now have databases where there are drugs, where drugs have been given, all the FDA approved drugs, any drug that's actually been used in humans has been mm -hmm. given to cells, different kinds of cells, even neuronal cells, and the gene expression consequence has been measured. So if we have a gene expression pattern, we can look backwards in the database to say what drugs look like that. That's not a way that we're gonna discover a drug for a disease. Mm -hmm. But it's going to give us a starting point to say, to identify a series of tool compounds that are safe in humans that, you know, that we can try. In some cases, this may lead to repurposing drugs, but in most cases, it's going to help us mechanistically dissect. And so I'll give you an example. We've shown, for example, with, under the following logic, that we can identify drugs that improve neural repair after axonal injury by comparing damage to the peripheral nervous system to damage to the central nervous system. Peripheral nervous system grows, central nervous system doesn't after injury. And we can ask what are the gene expression programs or networks that are turned on and what are their drivers? And then we can use those to search drug gene database. And we find there that we can identify drugs that, that indeed do reverse the patterns. That's step one. 
The second step is, does that actually reversing that pattern lead to the phenotypic consequence? In other words, does it lead to neural repair, increased axonal outgrowth? And the answer is yes, we can do that, those types of experiments. It's a little bit more difficult in autism or schizophrenia, where we don't actually know what the phenotype of interest is, but in neurodegeneration or neural repair, I think it's now tractable. This is a figure that my colleague, Jessica Retzak at UCLA uh, developed as we were thinking about the kind of work that we were doing. And it kind of beautif beautifully kind of explains one way to think about this. You can identify drugs now that induce network gene expression patterns. You can validate the drug engagement by basically giving the drug and showing that it has the impact that you're interested in, more axonal growth, less neuronal death. But then you can be pretty sure that the drug isn't pushing the entire network, it's just doing enough of it to show a phenotypic effect. And our notion is that maybe it will take four or five different drug pharmacologic perturbations to end up being able to recapitulate the entire network. So you map the validated drugs back to network genes. You can use CRISPR and other genome engineering techniques to actually validate that. So for example, I can say that this drug is likely acting through, the, through this set of transcription factors that's driving a gene expression pattern that's underlying neurodegeneration. Well, if I CRISPR out, if I delete those transcription factor drivers, the drug should no longer have an effect, right? And so we can use these kind of high throughput methods to then build an original network from the validated drug gene target maps. And so this is really a way of beginning to think about biology and high throughput, again, not one gene at a time. So my sense is that in the laboratory, now that we can do GWAS and identify 100 loci for Alzheimer's disease, we can't study one locus at a time. We need to study all of them or a lot of them in parallel. We need to understand in an individual, what are the components that are necessary to cause the disease and then to study all of those in parallel using new automated high throughput methods so that we can begin to dissect the actual true underlying biology and develop drugs. It's a phenomenal future to be sure. So how does all of this technology and advances in genomic sequencing impact clinical medicine uh, today? And what do you see in the next 10 years? This is something that I actually think about virtually every day. We've been able to use sequencing and genomics in the laboratory to our great advantage, but it really hasn't moved into the clinic as rapidly as many of us would hoped. And some of that has to do with cost and also um, the advent of powerful enough computer systems to really handle all the data. And so my thinking about this is that we're gonna have a new paradigm that merges clinical care and research. We're in, especially in big academic medical systems and other healthcare systems. The healthcare system itself is a learning healthcare system where discovery, basic and translational research is driven actually from patient data that we build biobanks and we genotype and sequence and get methylomes and understand the environmental, the lifestyle factors, the socioeconomic factors, the social determinants of health. And we compile those into discovery engines is the only way I can really think about it, that then fuel new hypotheses that then we can test so that we can predict and prevent disease. So one idea here is that when we're thinking about treatment or di you know, first thing that comes before treatment is diagnosis. And so again, I can imagine I'm sitting with a patient, let's say you're an internist or, or a neurologist and the patient's had a stroke and they have hypertension. 
Well, now you, your healthcare system is part of that learning healthcare system. There have been computer scientists and data scientists and genomicists working in the background to study these things. And they've created learning and knowledge that now when you see patient X in front of you, you're seeing them in the context of let's say 900 patients who are almost identical to them from a sociodemographic and social determinants, diet, lifestyle, et cetera, standpoint, as well as genetics. And instead of prescribing the antihypertensive that you like to prescribe the most, the system is telling you that there are two other antihypertensive drugs that are much more effective in this population, especially in patients who are already taking the drugs that your patient is taking, et cetera. And so we're, we're using information from the normal course of clinical care that's being applied to our patient to optimize their individual care but that work is going on, a lot of it, in the background and is kind of feeding back in. So we have a true virtuous cycle where research and clinical care are truly connected. And it really is big data that's driving this. So our uh, role as neurologists uh, is to make sure that the phenotyping is well done and that it's accessible to be able to link to the, um, the genomic, uh, proteomic, metabolomic, uh, environmental information that we can glean. It's a truly an exciting future. One of the big drivers of this revolution in medicine is going to be the availability of a sub $100 genome. And in that case, I believe that health systems will start sequencing every patient for a lot of reasons. And I think that's gonna happen in the next three to five years. So this is a huge amount of data that we're uh, going to benefit from. Are we ready to handle it all? And what do we need to be able to, uh, to take full advantage? Well, the health systems are not ready for this. This is really going to have a major change in our practice and we're gonna need a much more investment in computational infrastructure. So, you know, the health system of the future, and I'm talking about the near future, five years, it, it's gonna be a, a massive change in the amount of data and how to handle it. And right now we have a medical record that's kind of static, but imagine when you see the patient, if it's actually operating on that data in the background. So we're gonna to have to have some way to do that, I believe, to really have the most most informative kinds of decision support. Advances in quantum computing. This, this is not fundamentally a hardware problem at this point. It's really the software and the kind of software that our medical records are built on isn't, isn't built for doing this. So we're gonna need different database structures to be able to handle that. And so it's really a software engineering issue, um, a health system culture issue, a medical school culture issue in terms of how we train our students and residents, et cetera. Dr. Geshwin, thank you so much for a fascinating discussion. Uh, we will be working on preparations for the future, uh, looking forward to new therapeutics based on uh, these fascinating approaches and getting ready to handle a great deal of information. Well, it's been great talking with you. Thank you so much for this opportunity.